Hello everyone and welcome to Exchange for Media live from Khan. Now, Group M, the investment arm of WPP, releases every year the annual, the this year, next year report. The report highlights an all-encompassing view of the global ad market, summarizing past year and looking forward to what we can expect next year. As we all know, that this is a report which the entire ad media marketing and advertising industry looks forward to. I'm very happy to have with me today Kate Scott Dawkins. She's the author of the report and and the president, Global Business Intelligence Group M. Kate, welcome to Exchange for Media. Thank you so much for having me. Kate, I just firstly, just the key highlights from the report. As per the report, global advertising revenue will grow 7.8% in 2024 to 89.8 billion. This is an upward revision of uh, from the 5.3 that was forecast in December. So in six months, you've seen this change in sentiment. Also, the industry will is expected to surpass 1 trillion in revenue in 2025 which will this is a growth of 6.8 million to 1.1 trillion right so i just want to first ask you what are the key takeaways from the fr this year next year 2024 global mid media forecast report yeah, so it is a, an upward revision, right? We did say 5.3% in December and 7.8% now. Um, I think there's an important nuance in that and that this is not necessarily driven by just increased optimism about the global economy. Um, with TYNY, it's a massive undertaking. We're looking at publicly available financial data. We are often going back and revising historicals based on new data sources or changes in our modeling. Um, and that's really what's driven a big part of the revision for this June. So um, we made some big changes in China. You know, China and the U.S. alone make up more than 57% of global advertising revenue. And so when we revise those forecasts and upgrade those forecasts, they tend to have an, a very large impact on the global figures. And within China over the last six months, we've revised some modeling and uh, increased our expectations for revenue to a couple of the digital platforms in China. So Duyen, which is the ByteDance-owned sister app to TikTok, uh, and Red there as well. We're seeing some, um, like what had typically been offline sales activity that's actually been moving on to these social platforms. Um, and so that's what's kind of been a large part of the upward revision, not necessarily better expectations or, or very optimistic expectations for uh, consumer spending in that market or, or globally. Uh, yeah. But uh, the upward revision from 5.3 to 7.8 is quite significant. Other than these factors that you just mentioned, is there any bit, are you seeing the change in sentiment also globally? Yeah, I mean, if we exclude China and the U.S., right, and, and that China is an incremental $40 billion, nearly $40 billion uh, this year, so that is most of that 7.8% uh, or the, the incremental. If we remove the U.S. and China um, and we look at our December forecast versus now, it's 6.5% in December to an expectation of 6.9% now, excluding those two markets. So it is more positive, but at a, a much smaller differential. Um, now, the forecast says the industry will surpass $1 trillion in revenue. However, this is a deaccelerated growth of 6.8%. What is contributing to this? Well, it's important to know when we look at our report that we uh, we provide nominal figures. So we are including uh, inflation impacts, and inflation can tend to have a, a overall positive impact on marketing growth. Uh, so we're, we're expecting inflation to continue going down um, over the next year, and so that is part of that uh, deceleration as well, right? It's probably better in real terms uh, when you adjust for inflation, even though at a nominal rate it looks like a deceleration. Um, but if we look at a five-year forecast till 2029, it's a 5.9% compound annual growth rate. Is this normalization of growth? And have we come out, has the industry come out of the effects of COVID-19 pandemic? Or is those effects still lingering on in the industry? It's a great question. I think we, we are coming into more of a, a normalized period of growth. There's huge volatility 
um, you know, during the pandemic and actually even leading up to the pandemic, we saw growth rates within advertising revenue that were actually higher than global GDP. So this 5.9 percent, you know, compound annual rate going forward is back down to a long-standing trend of being slightly slower than global GDP growth. Um, and so I'd call that, yeah, a, a stabilization over the next five years and um, sort of moving out of the volatility period of the last couple of years. That's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, this is something which is part, uh, particularly interesting to me was retail media. And also, as you will know, that India has seen an explosion in commerce media, retail media, and particularly quick commerce media. So, you know, what is fascinating in the report was that the growth of retail media is expected to represent 15.1% of total ad revenue in 2024. And this was just 1.5% a decade ago this is really a huge jump so how do you see what are the factors behind this and how do you see this panning out in the next five years is retail media going to take away a larger chunk of the advertising revenue yeah we have seen really explosive growth over the last decade you're right um it is astounding and we i think we're the first of the you know forecasters to really introduce this as its own group it was so important to us to be able to measure it separately and to really introduce the concept of these new media owners right retailers as media owners um walmart is one of those that's seen this incredible growth over the last you know few years as well they've made it into our top 10 uh, our top 25, excuse me, uh, global media owners for the first time this year. Um, and their, you know, uh, Flipkart um, business is growing very well. You hear their CEOs talk about uh, the impact it's having on their international growth rates. So hugely important. I think we're, we're, it's now at such a scale, especially in the larger markets where growth is maybe decelerating somewhat in markets like, although the U.S. we're still predicting more than 20% this year, China similarly still growing quickly. I think that speaks to... Um, how much room there is still for e-commerce in general, uh, how much innovation is happening in terms of retail media encompassing not just search on retail sites, but also using retail data to buy on other channels like CTV or other digital uh, you know, sites and, and platforms. So I think we're going to continue to see a lot of innovation and continue to see growth, although the, the share, you know, will expand, just not necessarily quite at that rate as we've seen over the last decade. Uh, you mentioned Flipkart, which is an Indian owned, which is an Indian company. So just looking at the Indian context, how do you see retail media also contributing here and uh, especially quick commerce? Yeah, well, the, the growth rates for India in terms of our retail media segment are, um, you know, well into the double digits. Um, so it is increasing there substantially. And we see a lot of, um, you know, competition between Flipkart and Amazon there. Uh, and then the, the element of the ONDC is certainly fascinating as well, right? And the element of the government wanting these larger platforms to open up their marketplaces to these shops and sellers that are on the ONDC as well. Um, so India is a fascinating market to, to watch in this space. And even, uh, you know, the topic this year and last year at Khan was AI. So what is the growth that you're seeing over, say, the next two years? Yes, yeah, so we actually have a, a number in the report that we uh, look at, which is AI-enabled advertising. Um, and this is a, something that we wanted to qualify and quantify for people in just the extent to which AI is already being used in advertising and how long-standing it's been. So when we think about these platforms, um, they have been using elements of AI like natural language processing and machine learning for more than a decade. It's been built into the fabric of advertising. Um, and now we're seeing a huge expansion with more of a um, consumer-based and consumer-focused use of AI that's only going to increase its, pre its prevalence and its innovation over the next couple of years. We expect that by 2029, 94.1% uh, of advertising will be AI-enabled or touched in some way, which is just a huge number. That's my headline. <laughs> 
Anyway, the other interesting part of the report which I found was the dominance of the top five advertising sellers is also significant. That's Google, Amazon, Meta, ByteDance and Alibaba. They grew at 23% and estimated compound annual growth rate for uh, 2016 to 2023. But in comparison, the other sellers only grew at 2.1%. I understand, you know, these numbers, but is it just because di digital has becoming all-encompassing and such a critical part of our lives? I think there are a couple of things going on here. Um, one, I think I would point to an overarching trend that we've seen over the last decade of increased globalization, increased consolidation, right? So there are benefits to scaled companies. Um, and digital services have made that much easier, right? You don't have to move physical products to start offering, you know, Google or Meta products in a new country. Uh, it's a little bit easier to turn on that scale for them. Um, and so I think that's really helped them over the last decade, you know, global financial markets, uh, global internet penetration, these things have all contributed to their ability to grow at, at, at quite a pace over the last, you know, uh, seven to 10 years. And now we, in the, the sort of other category, that 2.1%, there certainly are other fast-growing companies, right? Um, again, I'll point to Walmart and their advertising revenue, both internationally and in the U.S., um, but, and, but it's sort of combated, it's offset by declines that we are seeing in some linear channels, like linear TV, linear auto, audio, certainly print, unfortunately, where digital growth isn't enough to necessarily offset uh, traditional newspaper and traditional magazine declines. So it's a, it's a rapidly changing marketplace and industry, um, but it is astounding the extent to which these companies have been able to really globalize their offering and that scale I think has afforded them the, the ability to grow at those kind of rates. You kind of preempted my next question. I was going to ask you what is going to happen to traditional media if only these five companies are going to take a large chunk. We've already seen many have predicted the demise of print which you just mentioned. What about TV? You know walking down uh, there's a uh, in one of the cafes, the Wall Street Journal cafe. You know uh, there was an interesting um, uh, report which they put up on the screen which said that uh, nowadays even in the US it's the older generation which is watching television so what happens to your traditional media? I think it, there is another element of consolidation right so the the largest companies the most scaled companies will do best within those channels uh, within publishers I think it's the the companies that can um, you know, encourage and earn logged in users, logged in subscribers. That gives them the ability to, you know, have subscriber revenue, but also have an audience for advertisers. Um, that won't be possible across the entire breadth of publishers. So again, I think we're going to see uh, the largest, most scaled players rise to the top. And to some extent, that's what we're seeing with TV as well, as we have you know, majority U.S. owned large global companies like Disney, like Comcast, um, the ones who are able to really invest in local language content around the world and then, you know, use that to grow global audiences and streaming platforms enable them to you know, provide offerings and provide entertainment around the world in a similar sort of model, I would say, to the, the globalization of the Internet companies. So, yeah. If you could just highlight one, or what are some of the media trends and opportunities that you're forecasting? Or yeah, I mean, I think uh, some of the areas which we don't tend to think of as often, things like digital out of home and out of home in general, when we talk about the declines in linear TV and the, the kind of erosion of that reach, advertisers still need mass media. Um, and so I think out of home and audio actually both are places where they can continue to get a broad audience. They can continue to get reach. They continue to be on highly effective formats. Um, and so those are two channels that we're watching very, very closely uh, as emerging opportunities as well. So when you say audio, so does this mean only podcasts or are you also including radio in this? No, I think the, the history of uh, efficacy has shown that audio produces you know, or, or performs quite well in that sense. So I would include uh, terrestrial audio with digital in that sense and the same for out of home. Um, there is something about uh, a, a large installation or a really impactful out-of-home, whether it's a banner or whether it's a you know, one of those new 
3D creations where it feels like it's coming out at you, I think those tend to uh, engage consumers in a really impactful way. Uh, now coming specifically to India, India has been uh, you know, seen as one of the growth markets globally. Uh, you have said that the advertising revenue in India is expected to climb 9.5% to 18.5 billion in 2024. But when we look at 2025, there's a slight decline and the growth will be 87 uh, So what's the cause for this or should we should we not see this as concerning? I don't think you should see it as concerning. I think similar to what we talked about in terms of nominal versus real growth, yeah, it's going to be an increasing deceleration of inflation, uh, which, again, will feel better in real terms, even though as a headline number, it's decelerating. Again, just sticking to India, you know, we've had the general elections this year. We have three state elections coming up and IPL that happens every year. Uh, and let's not forget the T20, which is currently going on in the Olympics. Will Are these also adding a, sign, uh, a slight, uh, say, a significant part of the revenue? You know, sports is fascinating. I spend a long time thinking about sports. I love sports. Um, and it's one of those areas where increasingly we view these tournaments as uh, not necessarily incremental each year, but more about shifts. So shifts to the media rights holders, shifts in time of year, um, but less in, in a, a boost for um, a single year. Now, where that changes is, say, uh, the next time the T20 tournament is in India, sometimes we see a boost. Or if the Olympics are in India, we sometimes see a boost for the host country. So France's growth rate this year is higher than it would be if they weren't hosting the Olympics. Um, but we, otherwise, we don't tend to see an industry-level bump from these activities. Um, the election as well, we're expecting that uh, political ad spending in India will represent about 1%, 0.9% of total ad revenue for this year. So not a huge contributor uh, to the overall number. We spoke about retail media, but the other category which was seeing a significant growth was CTV. So can you just elaborate on what's driving this growth? Yeah, it's fascinating time and space for this, I think. Um, it's still early enough that there are a lot of competitors, a lot of new players in the space around the world. Um, and so that is certainly driving an element of this. You have uh, players like YouTube that have been around a long time, and then you have sort of broadcast video on demand and, and traditional studios that have their offerings, and then international as well. Um, and India is a very dynamic market when we think about some of the movement with Star and Viacom 18. So lots happening there as companies try to figure out how they are going to translate some of these massive investments in content that are required to generate viewership um, and how they translate that into a profitable streaming business going forward. Now, this year at Cannes, uh, you know, they've also included the social, uh, the, the influencers and the content creators. Uh, but somehow, in, in, but in the report, you have not included this. In the future, do you believe that uh, content creators will also be added to your report? What is, uh, you know, how do you see this panning out uh, in the future? And where will you place it in digital or is this going to be a new category? That's a great question um, and a, a really, uh, you know, an area that we've seen a lot of movement in the last few years, right? I think the, the brand uh, partnerships with creators have really increased. The uh, creators as a decentralized, you know, media economy, very, very interesting. We don't include uh, revenue that goes uh, or would be reported directly by creators and influencers that is not included in our report um partly because it's so opaque you know we, we can't get the tax returns of all these individual creators to know exactly what they were making um we do include anything that is uh categorized as revenue by the media owners so anything that the platform takes as a fee or a share or anything like that we include uh, but not the, the money, the revenue going directly to the creators. Um, and some of, you know, what that looks like going forward will depend on um, available data sources, uh, you know, how, how much we feel we can 
sort of trust those figures because it is such a decentralized group um, and because the, the reporting is, is not the same as having, you know, publicly available financial information like 10Qs and 10Ks from, from some companies. You also moved CTV, if I'm not wrong, into digital, right? Uh, we moved some YouTube revenue from digital into CTV. Because we, yes, we, we believe that is more and a more accurate reflection of how a lot of advertisers and marketers are thinking about a holistic video picture, right? Um, India, our team in India has actually been kind of accounting for this for some time, so ahead of the curve um, in terms of the the fact that broadcast players were using YouTube and, and putting their content on YouTube and earning revenue from that. And so some of that has actually been in our CTV category over the past several years. Um, so we're well ahead of the curve, but we're now getting there with other markets as well around the world. Finally, I just want to know, this is an exhaustive report. How much time does it take you to, you know, do the number crunching? And what are the challenges when you're bringing out this report? Not once, but twice a year. Yeah. Uh, uh, it is a, a beast. <laughs> um, we, you know, start the process easily three months in advance, and then it's really about um, collecting available data, working with, you know, one of the great things about Group M and our network is that we have offices and uh, contributors around the world. We have six, more than 60 tracked markets. And so we really spend time digging into the data for each of those markets. And it does take time to... Um, to collate all of the data sources, to interrogate it, to make sure that we're drawing the right conclusions from the data, um, and then presenting that to our clients, who are ultimately, you know, the the first and primary audience for this. I agree with what you said. It's a real beast. Thank you so much, Kate, for your time. It was really insightful talking to you. Oh, thank you so much. It was lovely to chat.